Good afternoon. I'm Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our uh, respiratory season update today. I'm honoured to be here. We're honoured to be here on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. It's Public Health Week where we rep recognize all of the people doing extraordinary work in very challenging times in public health. And in Public Health Week, it's my particular honor to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry, our Provincial Health Officer. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, so I'm very pleased today that we're able to present um, some data and give you a summary and an update of where we are in the respiratory season uh, this year. So to start with, um, this is a slide that is familiar to most people, I think. It goes back one year to April of last year. And it, uh, I'm going to walk through the epidemiology that we're seeing right now of COVID uh, influenza and RSV. and some of the other respiratory infections that we've been seeing. And we're going to talk about changes to the restrictions that are currently in place in our healthcare settings and some of the surveillance um, tools that we're continuing to have. So as you know, for the past year, the COVID-19 that we've been seeing has all been variants of Omicron. And what we have seen is a leveling off and a decreasing of hospitalizations and the new daily hospitalizations are presented here. And as you know, these are anybody who is in hospital with a positive COVID test. So we know that um, a good proportion of these people have incidental findings and the reason for hospitalization is not necessarily related to their COVID. And in addition, we present all cause mortality within 30 days of a positive test. And the dotted line on the bottom is when we update, so it's not as timely as the information we get about daily deaths, but it is um, more uh, the underlying cause of death that we get from vital statistics. And that has shown quite consistently over the past year that about 40% on average of people who um, die with a positive COVID test, um, that, that their death is directly related or indirectly related to COVID-19. And as we've seen throughout this pandemic, people who are older, particularly people over age 80, and people who are immune compromised, where the vaccine doesn't work as well, are more likely to be hospitalized and have a higher rate of hospitalizations. So they are the people who are most severely affected. And we've seen that consistently, and we can see from our data here that it is people over age 80 in particular who are more likely to, to uh, be hospitalized. And that's, of course, why we are focusing on this group of people for the spring boot Booster, which is really starting in earnest this week, uh, six months after people received their last vaccine. And as we say, as I mentioned, our 30-day all-cause mortality has been um, coming down over the last little while, and we've been following this um, consistently. Um, as I said, the more accurate underlying cause of death from vital statistics confirms about 40% of, of people who die, primarily older people, um, are from or are related to COVID. Other things that we've been following um, along the way have been the impact of vaccinations. And so this is age standardized rates of COVID hospitalizations, critical care admissions and deaths um, starting in September of 2022. So just over the last period of time. And what we can see across the board is that the highest risk continues to be in people who do not have any vaccine and that's across all age groups. Um, so for age matched, um, people, despite having, we know there's a lot of people who've had infections with COVID at various times and including reinfections, the best protection you have continues to be from vaccination and from vaccination and some people, in some cases, um, having infections as well. I want to talk a little bit about uh, wastewater because if we've been in a transition and it has been I've heard from many people that it has uh, the current figures that we have up on our BC CDC website um, show when the new testing protocols that we have were put in place but it is somewhat confusing because there is it looks like there is an increase in uh, detections when what we've done at the BC CDC is go back and retest all of the archived wastewater samples from the past year so that our 
future reports will all now be on the same baseline using these more accurate, more precise tests. And what we've learned from that is what we've been trying to say, but now we can um, put it up on the website in a much more understandable fashion, is that the COVID uh, levels, or the SARS-CoV-2, the virus levels in wastewater, in March in particular, were stable and decreasing at all sites across the province. So this is the, the ones that we've had in place for quite a long time, since the beginning of the pandemic um, in Metro Vancouver. And as we can see, there was a leveling off and, and some oscillation over time, which is um, something that we expect to see in wastewater. And I would just note that um, for those who are looking at the details of this, the load per capacity axis is higher. So it's the number is higher on the, on the x-axis with the new tests because these new tests pick up more of the virus. But the number is not as important as the trends that we're seeing over time. So what this gives us a better example of is what we're, what we're seeing over time, and that's the important part that we look at. The fact that we're able to pick up more of the virus enables us to do more whole genome sequencing, and that's also a really important part of our surveillance. It allows us to, uh, to determine what strains or what variants of the, the, in this case, mostly Omicron, are circulating where around the province. And of course, really interestingly and, and exciting for us is that we now have um, some good data from fall of last year in island health and interior health. And again, in all of those um, communities where we're doing wastewater surveillance, we're seeing similar patterns smaller numbers and they're more flexible um, or the more variation because these are smaller communities but in all cases we're seeing a nice decrease over time. I do want to talk a little bit about uh, markers of immunity in the community and we do that by understanding things the seroprevalence. So how many people have antibodies in their blood from either infection or from vaccination or from combinations of those? And this uh, slide is an updated up to the end of December 2022, and it really shows us that we have a lot of immunity or markers of immunity in our community across the board. In young people, it's more likely to be a combination of infections and vaccination. And in older people, particularly people 70 and 80 and older, it shows that the vaccines have been working really well. The proportion of people in that age group who have immunity from infection is much less. So we have a very high level of antibodies from the combination as well of infection and vaccination. And that's really important. That hybrid immunity gives us a lot of buffer. So it protects not only us as individuals, but the fact that we have a level of immunity in our community means those people who don't respond as well to vaccines or whose immunity wanes are protected because the rest of us are protected too. And we see in younger people, there's many combinations of immunity that we see right now. So combinations of vaccination and infection, people may have two doses and an infection or several infections or three doses or four. And so all of that together tells us that we have quite robust immunity in our community. And that's been borne out with what we see in the, in the hospitalization and the serious illness as well, where those have stayed down or level. So this past fall and winter, we also experienced a very significant, for the first time in a couple of years, influenza and RSV season added on to COVID. And in particular, we had uh, increases in the fall, as you will recall, um, particularly in children. So this shows um, the reason or the, uh, the trajectory, trajectory of what we've been seeing of, uh, since the fall in uh, the pediatric population. And so it is a mixture, but um, we have seen for the first time in a couple of years that influenza, which is the purple in this, really peaked quite early, earlier than we usually see it in young people. And we also, at the same time, started to see RSV increasing. If we look to where we are now in March and, and later in February, we're seeing other viruses that are still causing respiratory infections, particularly what we call enteroviruses and rhinoviruses and adenoviruses. So those are ones that cause typical cold-like symptoms. And I think 
my, many people I know anyway um, are still seeing lots of coughs and colds in kids and in older people and most of them right now are not being caused as we say by um, by influenza we did see a little blip in influenza B in uh, late March and early April but uh, influenza is now leveling off and, and going away so if we look at um, the, the what we saw in breaking it down by different viruses, particularly focusing on influenza, RSV, and SARS-CoV-2. This is what we saw in the overall BC population, quite a peak of influenza in November, so earlier than we usually saw it. And we did a press briefing, we were talking about that impacting adults as well as children, and we had some severe illness in children that was related to influenza. And we can see quite a dramatic decrease in a large part of that is because we had such a great uptake of, of flu vaccine in the fall. That helped us moderate and temper that increase in, in influenza. We also saw RSV increase, um, particularly in children, and you can see that this is focusing on the data we have from Lower Mainland, so Vancouver, Richmond, and North Shore, but it reflects what's happened in the rest of the province as well, where RSV and influenza were both at their peak around the same time, and a little bit later for RSV, but it's also decreased. And in the midst of that, for the older populations, we see uh, that SARS is relatively, or SARS-CoV-2 is relatively steady and for children it was low and steady as well. I put this slide in just to give you a sense of where we are with it, what we saw this past respiratory season um, with influenza and RSV compared to historical averages. This is 10-year averages from previous seasons. So the green line shows uh, the last few months that we've been through and we can see we had a much earlier peak of influenza but that it came down quite rapidly and a large part of that was because of uh, people being vaccinated. And we saw a little bit of a blip with uh, influenza B, but it's hardly noticeable in the um, figure here. And then in, um, RSV was the same thing. We saw an earlier and sharper peak of RSV, but it also has settled down. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the surveillance products that we have in the BC CDC, and there's some dates up here that people can have. Um, just to reiterate that the surveillance that we've been doing is key to understanding all of our respiratory viruses and how they're behaving, and we will continue to do this. But as we usually do, once flu season is settling down and the, the typical respiratory season is settling down, we, uh, we go to a, a, a longer interval. So the, the respiratory data web page on uh, the BCCDC web, um, website will be updated today and we'll have the new wastewater on there um, and it will be updated then bi-weekly until the end of May and then we'll have our end of season report. For COVID, we are going to continue because we're still in that transition period of the pandemic and there's still some uncertainty about where we're going to be. So you will get um, bi-weekly reports of COVID on the BCCDC dashboard um, through the summer and into next year, um, and, but we'll go to monthly um, in, in May just because things are not changing that quickly. Um, the other thing I wanted to put in, and I'll go through this pretty quickly, um, we have, along with these changes, we revised the algorithm that goes into the, the reporting of infections, hospitalizations, and new daily deaths. And uh, to make sure, uh, uh, we talked about this last fall, but in the past, the way that the algorithms were working, it included the first infection. And we now know that many people have had reinfections. So we've uh, revised the algorithm to include reinfections after a period of 30 days. And uh, the team went back and reanalyzed the data since we made the initial changes in April of 2022. And you can see that there really is very little little difference in the, um, the numbers and the rates over time, but this is a more sustainable way to approach it and it includes, which will be important for the future, being able to include uh, reinfections in these. So there'll be uh, footnotes about how this is all done for those who, who need those in the, on the website. So what does this all mean? We said we would keep many of the restrictions that we've had in place in our healthcare settings in particular over this season. And uh, we're now at the point where surveillance will continue, 
and we, we will continue to monitor what's happening, and the, the vaccine requirements for healthcare workers will continue. But we're at a point now where we can change some of the restrictions in healthcare settings, in particular, uh, lifting the visitor proof of vaccine, uh, vaccine um, requirements and the rapid antigen test requirements before entering a long-term care assisted living home and some other healthcare facilities. Um, and removing the mandatory universal mask wearing in all healthcare settings. So uh, what is important to note is while the mandatory masking orders are being lifted, masking remains a very important tool in the healthcare setting. And healthcare workers will still wear masks based on their risk assessment. So what patient they're seeing, what the symptoms are, what the person has, where the setting they're in. And you might be asked to wear a mask particularly if you have symptoms yourself and are going into a healthcare setting for care, or are in certain settings within the healthcare facility. So there are some units, some parts of, of our hospitals, for example, um, that require masking and have uh, for a long time. Things like uh, people who have uh, units that look after people who are severely immune compromised or burn units. Um, as well, we have a couple of healthcare settings, so healthcare facilities and, and long-term care homes that are experiencing outbreaks. And they will continue to have outbreak measures in place, which may include limiting um, visitors and masking as well. Especially though, as we transition over the next few days, you may be asked to wear a mask as people are adjusting to the new um, changes. And uh, I encourage people to please, as we've been all along with every change, it takes time for these things to happen. So I encourage patience and kindness if you're going into a long-term care home or a healthcare facility in the next few days. Of course, at any point, and I can't stress this enough, anybody who is showing symptoms of respiratory illness, you will be asked to wear a mask. You may be asked to come at a different time of the day so that you're not sitting in a waiting room with other people, etc. And of course, we must continue to be vigilant and take precautions and follow our guidance that we know so well now. Uh, COVID has not gone away. We are still seeing other viruses that cause illnesses. So importantly, staying home or away from others if you're feeling unwell, particularly if you have a fever. That's a sign that you have something that may be infectious to others. And really importantly, don't go visit elderly relatives or in long-term care if you are feeling unwell. Practice the respiratory etiquette that we've all become used to, so covering your mouth when you cough, using a tissue, throwing it away, wearing a mask if you have mild symptoms and you need to be out, cleaning your hands frequently, still really important, and remain our first lines of defense. We are emerging from this pandemic, and we no longer need to have some of these orders in place. Uh, for masking, for checking vaccine status. But we need to continue to be mindful and vigilant, and we will be monitoring the trends of COVID-19, influenza, RSV, and the other causes of illness, as well as the global situation that we're in. This also means we may need to have an additional dose of vaccine at some point in the fall. And those are things that we don't yet know, but we will be monitoring and we'll be preparing for the fall. There may be mask requirements again in certain settings as we head into respiratory season next year. And I, I want to emphasize as well that the, the one uh, order that is still in place and will remain in place is the, the requirement for healthcare workers in all of our healthcare settings to be vaccinated. And that's incredibly important. Everybody in our healthcare setting is vaccinated now, and that protects ourselves, each other, and the settings that we work in. And it's one of the reasons why we have the confidence in moving ahead with removing some of the other restrictions in those settings now. Finally, I want, I'm very happy to let you know that we actually have our third round of the SPEAK Population Health Survey. And you recall we did two rounds in, over the last two years, and we want to hear from you about the impacts that the pandemic and the measures that we've put in place and uh, where you are in this part uh, uh, now in, in, uh, in this pandemic. 
And this helps us to understand where we need to pay attention and to build resiliency and well-being in our communities across the problem province. So it will be available very soon at the end of April online in 10 languages and you can register to participate using uh, bccdc.ca speak survey and uh, I encourage everybody to, con to look for this uh, when it comes out in April and to provide your feedback and your impact so that we know um, what we can do to help support people to recover over the next few years. So thank you very much. I um, hope everybody has a very safe and happy weekend and uh, continues to remember to be kind as we go through this next phase of our pandemic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And oh, that's right, you got the clicker. It's good. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about hospitalization and where it stands. And you see in this uh, chart the uh, trajectory of hospitalization and acute care in BC from uh, January 6 when we met uh, with the media and uh, and announced the opening of emergency operations centers across health authorities and where we are today and what you see is in that week and this is what you see in front of you is a seven-day moving average tradition typically on Monday there's fewer people in the hospital than on Thursday so this um, seven-day moving average it shows where that's been going. We know that on January 6th, there were just over 10,200 people uh, in hospital in BC, and today there are 9,647. And you see what's happened in that period, which is um, the reduction somewhat of hospitalizations. But I want to put it in context about how busy the healthcare system is right now, today. In September of 2020, the average hospitalization rate was 9,400. You see 9,400 well below the line on the chart there. That was the average in September of 2020, not uh, a period of high activity in the healthcare system typically in the month of September. So uh, this is a high level. And if you looked at the hospitalization levels in 2020 and 2021, you'd see much lower levels than this, even though we were dealing at that time, of course, with different uh, phases of the COVID-19 pandemic. What that tells us is that hospitalization remains high and the delivery of healthcare services is at a very high level in BC. Last week, the last measurable week, we set another record uh, for that week for the number of surgeries completed, for the amount of diagnostic tests um, uh, completed, but also that our healthcare workers are, uh, are busy across the board. And so some of this reflects a decline in uh, respiratory illness season, but what mitigates against that is that there are a lot of people who are um, who are needing hospital care right now and are sufficiently and seriously ill and seriously ill enough and you have to be seriously ill to be in hospital to get hospital care. I want to talk a little bit about what happened in January 2023. We put in place the emergency operations centers to prepare and manage for these issues around hospital occupancy. A number of actions were put in place, seven day a week support, integration with urgent and primary care centers, implementing quick response teams. We added long-term care and community beds in the system. Um, uh, measures in the hundreds were taken across health authorities to address and deal with the day-to-day -day challenges of very high hospital occupancy. On March 13th, we stood down the EOCs with many of the strategies though implemented staying in place. And we're continuing uh, to, uh, to, to implement actions that are focused on reducing ED admissions, improving efficiency reducing alternate level of care rates, which is very important in our hospital system, and ensuring that p patients are cared for in the proper setting. So that process is, uh, um, as we said, would be a time-limited process, but the measures that we've put in place continue to be in place. Um, going forward, obviously, we're gonna have to, uh, continued sustained focus on hospital capacity. So you're gonna see um, in the uh, late summer, early fall, uh, Dr. Henry and I will be here to present as we prepare for respiratory illness season next year, but also looking at actions we need to take in that period to potentially add hospital capacity to ensure that patient flow uh, efficiencies are in place and, uh, and also community-based strategies that we'll see. So we're gonna learn the lessons of this year and continue to work on this. We presented our acute care strategies for the fall in advance of the fall 2020, 2021, and of course 2022, you'll remember. And so uh, that process you can expect to see later on this year. With respect to, um, in particular, long-term care, but also acute care, um, Dr. Henry uh, 
spoke of changes in provincial health orders today. One of the actions that we took um, during the pandemic, it was a commitment that was made in September 2020 that we would add 7,000 people uh, to our healthcare system, the majority of them through a program called the Healthcare Access Program, which has been, in terms of health human resources, one of the most successful uh, health human resources programs um, in North America in a long time. And you see the results of this. You see that as of March 31st, um, um, uh, 2023, 20, uh, that should say, it reads slightly wrong, 1,521 FTEs, that's, that's full-time equivalents, full-time workers were working in long-term care and assisted living, and 577 FTE screeners were working in acute care. So those are on the screening side, people who are working often the front doors. Uh, many of you will be familiar with that if you're a visitor in long-term care, implementing the measures, but also checking, obviously, um, uh, the vaccine requirements and so on. Um, as of March 2023, 20, uh, 5,383 people have been hired into the healthcare access program, 4,388 of those in long-term care, 910 in home support, 85 in acute care. The funding for those programs remains in place, and in fact, the healthcare access program continues to expand, meaning that though some of the requirements have been changing, it's our view that that staff continues to be needed in those settings, and we've made it clear to both uh, long-term care settings and acute care settings that the funding is placed. And, and while well, the work of some of those, that staff may change, especially on the screening side, that they'll be continuing to, to work in their respective uh, facilities. Finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the uh, immunization program in the fall, first for influenza. 1.78 million British Columbians uh, of doses of influenza were administered in, in BC in this flu year, which is an absolute record. I believe the past record was 1,575,000. And this reflects, I think, and comparative to other, comparing to other provinces, this was an extraordinary success. And I wanna, first of all, thank British Columbians for responding to it. You saw in the data presented by Dr. Henry, you saw a visible, um, <coughs> a visible demonstration of the effect of that uh, commitment by people to get vaccinated. I just note that overwhelmingly those vaccinations were delivered in pharmacies around BC in an unprecedented way uh, and that uh, the result of that, in fact, 1,226,000 of them were delivered in pharmacies, about 25% of the remainder, uh, 436,000 in, uh, in health authority clinics and the rest in, uh, in uh, primary care provider offices, the remaining 5%. This is of course, all-time records for the participation of pharmacists, and it was pharmacists in communities around BC who played, I think, a critical and uh, important role both in the delivery of the COVID-19 uh, vaccine and the delivery of the influenza vaccine. This had an effect on people. People's health was spared because these actions were taken, and we are very appreciative for everyone involved. The, uh, with respect to the spring booster campaign, Dr. Henry talked about the need for immunization for most people that may come in the fall, but for some, there's a program now, those who are most vulnerable, uh, and these were based on the priority groups set out by Dr. Henry and by NACI. Um, just to note that the long-term care assisted living program for the, that spring booster will commence uh, Tuesday, April 11th, and be complete by uh, the end of May, 2023. In addition, invites have been going out in order uh, to priority groups. Uh, those over 80, those who are uh, clinically extremely vulnerable, over 18 in groups one and two, that's about 100,000 people. The next priority will be people who are clinically vulnerable in what's called category three, that's about 150,000 more people. Uh, people uh, with uh, 50 to 69 who are indigenous and, uh, and 60 to 79 of the general population and no history of COVID. So those are priority groups that have been set out and then it'll continue on with the priority groups as set out by Dr. Henry in our previous uh, briefings. I just say that last, um, uh, up to now, about 14,650 uh, doses have been administered in our spring booster campaign, which has just begun uh, at the end of last week. And yesterday, noting that the invitations have been going out, 14,000 uh, COVID vaccination bookings were completed. Um, over 600 pharmacies and 75 health authority clinics all over the province have booked spring booster appointments. 
and a small number of children for their COVID. Uh, there's a number of children as well who are obviously eligible. Another 16 health authority clinics are available for them across the province. In short, um, this uh, effort, this vaccine campaign, has reflected an exceptional effort across uh, public health and across community pharmacy. We are very appreciative, and I think everybody can see the positive effects on health of a successful immunization campaign. As we prepare for next year's effort, it demonstrates, I think, our continuing capacity to deliver an important a response to the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, I, I just want to say to, to say to everyone that the pandemic, of course, continues, and we have adapted again and again. But some of the fundamental principles that we've learned together in this time are important, and we need they bear repeating: stay home when you're sick. The most important thing wash our hands regularly, cough into our sleeve. All of the things that we've learned have helped us in dealing not just with COVID-19, but with other respiratory illnesses. I encourage everyone who has done all of these things for, for a very long period of time in support of one another and our health to continue to do so. To continue, of course, to learn and follow public health, uh, uh, public health information about COVID-19 as we continue through this phase of the pandemic. And with that, I'll invite Dr. Henry back and we'll be happy to take your questions. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one for the opportunity to ask a question and a follow-up. I will quickly look around the room to see if we have questions from the room to start. Uh, we are going to start with Kylie Stanton, Global News. Uh, Kylie, please go ahead. Sorry, I can't see you. The lights oh, are so sorry. Crazy. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Henry, you say you were emerging from the pandemic. Do you have a timeline, or you know, are we through? With, are we through it? Can you give an, give us an idea? You know, I, I think we've been coming out of the emergency phase for sure, and I think today's a good reflection of that. That we, you know, some of the additional restrictions we had in place through this past respiratory season have really helped us get through that phase. Um, we're, we still see quite a lot of COVID, and we saw that in our data today. We're seeing that around the world, but I think in the next few months, um, we're likely to, to be able to say we're no longer in a pandemic. COVID is going to be with us and we're going to have to be prepared for the uncertainty of next year. I talked about this a bit in the fall, you know, that we're going to see oscillations that change and we're sort of in a, a bit more of a steady state now. But we still don't know yet about the periodicity or the seasonality of this virus. Um, we have some ideas that it's worse in the winter when other things are worse and a little bit easier in the summer and we're sort of seeing that but we'll have to watch that so i i think the that we're in that middle phase um i think the emergency the the um, declaration of a pandemic is likely to be over in the next couple of months and then we'll just need to be um, prepared for next winter season when we're likely to see uh, again some combination of influenza and RSV and, and COVID. And so what does that mean for booster shots um, come mm -hmm. going into the fall? Will everyone need them or um, will it just be for priority groups? Yeah, that, that's a very good question to which I have no answer. <laughs> no, I can tell you my speculation. So what we're seeing and uh, is that uh, that combination of having had uh, your primary series, which is for the most part two doses, plus uh, additional boosters. And those boosters and the bivalent boosters are making a difference for people. And we see, do see uh, some waning of immunity from, um, from vaccine alone or from infection alone. But now, as the, the seroprevalence shows us, and, and we're seeing this globally as well, that that hybrid immunity seems to be long lasting, particularly to pr protect people against more severe illness causing hospitalizations or leading to crit need for critical care, et cetera. And that, um, as we're monitoring it over time, seems to be pretty steady. So it is like, and that's why this, uh, you know, the WHO came out with very similar recommendations about this spring, only higher risk people who don't get as strong a response from vaccine um, really need the vaccine right now. Um, going into the fall, I suspect we'll have a program similar to what we do with influenza, where it will be available for everyone. By that point, most of us will be at least a year since our last booster dose. And so we, we will likely see some waning or decreasing of immunity. So it's likely, and this is you know my speculation right now, given what we've been watching around the world, that we'll have a program um, where everybody is, uh, it's available for everybody. 
um, but we'll focus again on those people who are at highest risk of, of hospitalization, severe illness um, with both COVID and influenza. And I'm hopeful that in the future, there's a lot of great research that's being done on vaccines right now, that we're going to have a combination vaccine, either a combination of influenza plus COVID, um, or hopefully a vaccine that's what we call a pan-coronavirus vaccine that may only need to be given uh, maybe in two doses, and that will protect us against all the different variants of, of coronavirus. So there's lots of really exciting things that we don't yet have answers for. Our next question comes from Katie DeRosa, Vancouver Sun. Hi, Dr. Henry. If you're um, eliminating the requirement for vaccination for visitors, will there be any decision on the vaccination status for, for uh, healthcare workers? Yeah, so we, we've been talking about that, and I, I think I was very clear, but no. Right now, uh, the requirement to be vaccinated to work on our healthcare system is incredibly important. It has what has allowed us to, um, to now get back to a more normal pre-pandemic um, health care system in our long-term care homes in our hospitals. So that requirement, and um, we now have 100% of people in our health care system, pretty much, who are vaccinated. And that's been so important. It protects us. It protects us from passing it on to each other, um, protects us from having more severe illness so that we're unable to work, and it protects us from, um, it protects the people that we care for. So that is an ongoing Going requirement. It's a really important one. As I said, we still have a lot of uncertainty over the next little while, but I don't see that lifting. Uh, and this may be for you or for Minister Dix. It's about the nurse to patient ratios. And will it apply to private long term care settings? And if so, how do you enforce private uh, long term care to have the required number of, of nurses? Oh, that I don't. <laughs> So uh, two sets of things. There are, um, you have to distinguish between settings here. There's acute care hospital, those are all public in BC. Um, in long-term care, uh, there are about 30,000 publicly funded long-term care beds in the province. Um, about uh, 30 to 32 percent of those are health authority owned and operated. The other 68 percent, they might be not-for-profit, they might be for-profit, but they're all uh, publicly funded beds, that's how we deliver the service in BC. So when you're applying these standards, you do it across uh, across that system. Right? And so these are uh, contractual, uh, this is uh, a commitment that was made not uh, in a contractual negotiation, but with the BC Nurses Union, so it will apply across the public health care system. But that public health care system, we understand, um, is means a lot of places where the delivery isn't health authority own delivery. That can be doctor's offices, of course, that can be um, long-term care homes that, uh, that have public beds. So that's where the system has been placed, that's what uh, we've agreed to and that's what we're working towards. But my expectation would be that when you, as you um, raise standards for nurses, that that raising of standards would have an effect on the, the very small part of the system, which would be a fully private uh, care home of some sort. But um, this is for the public system, for public hospital, for public long-term care, for public community care. Um, and sometimes that public care is delivered, as I say, by a care home that's owned by a private operator. Next question, Mary Brook, Island Social Trends. Hi, thank you. Um, so the obvious earmarks of the pandemic seem to have faded. People aren't wearing masks in public. They're back to handshaking instead of the elbow bump that was recommended at one point. And so I'm just wondering if you'll be making strong recommendations to the public community, like to businesses, schools, um, retail in particular, so that they maintain um, their plexiglass perhaps in some situations or ventilation, I'm thinking in particular. Um, a lot of spaces have not been altered whatsoever. So now that the masks are down, the risk frankly is up in some closed tight retail spaces. Yeah, so I think we, we are in a different place now. And we look at the, the zero prevalence, that tells us the level of protection we have in our community. So these things that we put in place when 
Um, there wasn't vaccination, there wasn't immunity. We no longer need to have them in every situation. But that doesn't mean that everybody is still, uh, has the same degree of risk. There are some people um, who have compromised immune systems, for example, uh, who may not respond as well to vaccines, older people where it wanes more quickly, and you may want to continue to wear a, a well-fitted respirator or mask to protect yourself if you're going into those situations. But we can go back to having a more normal uh, interaction in many of the situations we're in now because we're not at that same risk level anymore. And while I, for one, um, hope to never go back to shaking hands, <laughs> um, just because <laughs> for my own reasons, uh, I prefer the fist bump. But uh, you know, these are things that, uh, that some people feel very strongly about and uh, it's important um, gestures for them. So I think we can go back safely now to many of these uh, many of these rituals and ceremonies that we had been putting off for this last little while. We've learned so much about how connectedness is so important for our emotional and mental health as well as our physical health. So I don't think we need to continue to have barriers in many of these situations. We absolutely need to continue to pay attention to indoor air quality and ventilation, and we've learned something about that. And so we need to continue, and I know we've been working with the schools, for example, to make sure there's ass assessments and upgrading of uh, ventilation systems in every school in the province. But the other really key things that we have in our control now as we get back to more normal um, interactions in many different settings is staying away if we're not feeling well ourselves or if we just have a mild symptom to wear a mask. And you know, I do that um, to stay home, particularly if you have a fever, to not go visit somebody who's more at risk if you're not feeling well yourself. So those are the things that we used to do, <laughs> maybe not thinking about it. We often had this idea of presenteeism, that we had to go to work no matter how bad we were feeling. I hope we have learned that now we can make it okay for somebody not to come for Easter dinner or Passover dinner if they're not feeling well themselves. And that we're more um, aware of these issues and more, um, what's the right word I'm trying to find, is uh, more patient with each other about um, these issues. And so if you are somebody in a very crowded environment, wear a mask or you know, keep your distance from people if, and particularly stay away from people who are more at risk if you're not feeling well. Now that we have long COVID with us for some people, mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, will that remain between a doctor and their patient to determine whether they have that? And will those people still have access to clinics? And will there be in the um, a line item somewhere in that BC Health budget that will um, continue the attention to long COVID and make sure that there are facilities within hospitals or that studies will continue, that it will be paid attention to going forward. Absolutely. Yeah, so I know the minister will have something about that. But, you know, the, we're learning as we go with this. So there's post-COVID syndromes that uh, for some people are very debilitating and for some people last quite a long time. And uh, we have a series of clinics. They are now mostly virtual and they've been able to provide um, the assessment and care that people need and support people's primary care providers to support them as well. So globally, we are learning about the different types of of long COVID syndromes that are out there and how they can be best managed. The, the things that we are also learning is that vaccinations make a big difference in preventing long COVID, even if you do get sick, and that we're seeing less of it um, in the last year with, uh, with Omicron. That doesn't mean that, that we're out of the woods. There's clearly things that we need to follow um, and that, you know, the, the positive side is we are seeing that most people get better over time and they need to be supported over time. So absolutely, we'll be continuing um, to support people getting the tests they need, getting the access to the, the support from the, the, um, the clinics of which we have access around the province now that they're virtual as well. And I know Minister Dix can talk about funding. Um, and speci specifically on the funding, the, the funding is there and those, the, the funding for that network has been made permanent. What changed in a really a short period of time from the fall of 2022 to the early months of 2023 was the number of people presenting uh, to those clinics across the province. And there were only a few locations against, uh, obviously, uh, cases that came around from across the province. So we went 
in a given month from about 750 referrals to about 80 referrals, and that changes the way you organizing your healthcare response. We were the first province to put in a network of care around what's, some, what's called long COVID. It's called different things, but called long COVID. That has continued to be there. It's now funded in the base of uh, the healthcare system. It's organized uh, uh, centrally, and that allows us to provide care everywhere in the province. And so there was some discussion around the existence of the clinics and whether the system should stay the same. It obviously doesn't stay, stay the same when the number of, um, of uh, new referrals drops by uh, approximately 90%, you want to adjust. But the care is there, and there's continuing care being provided to thousands of British Columbians through that network. But for any system of chronic treatment to be effective, it has to be effective everywhere, and it has to be based on a strong primary care system and a strong team-based care across the province supported by that network of expertise. We're learning more every single day, and uh, Dr. Henry will tell you many, much about what we're learning about the ongoing impact of um, of COVID-19 on, on some people who are dealing with that. And so we want the best evidence and the best possible information available. That is at the core of what we do uh, now, and it's been become a permanent uh, item in the healthcare budget. One more question in the room before we go to the phones. We hear from Mira Bain, CBC. Okay, this question is for Dr. Henry. Um, my colleagues are wondering if you could expand upon you know, what kind of healthcare settings might we see the universal mandatory masking lifted in? Are we talking about hospitals, clinics, or what kind of situations? So right now, um, there's a combination of ministerial orders and public health officer orders that require um, all visitors, all staff to wear masks at all times in healthcare settings. And there's recommendations to uh, uh, community providers through the colleges to around masking in, in physicians' offices, for, ex uh, for example. So today, uh, all of those orders are lifted. So um, there is no more mandatory universal masking in all healthcare settings. So in hospitals, in long-term care homes. However, it, there are many situations in healthcare where masks are used routinely. And we, we do what we call a point of care risk assessment. So if there's a patient who has certain types of droplet spread diseases, and then they're in a certain room, and one of the precautions that healthcare workers do is wear masks. And the, if in outbreaks, for example, of respiratory illness, masks are part of what we do to help manage those outbreaks, along with other things, um, including visitor restrictions, et cetera. So what we're taking away is the mandatory all the time for everybody in the healthcare setting, because we no longer need that extra level of protection. Having said that, um, we're talking with the infection prevention and control and occupational health experts, uh, both across Canada and in BC. And you know, the, we recognize that in healthcare settings, particularly wearing of masks was very helpful um, when we had a lot of respiratory illness around. So we'll be looking at that again for next fall. Uh, and this question is for Minister Dix. Um, uh, this is uh, from one of my other colleagues. Um, and this is about the Kamloops Maternity Clinic. Uh, what's being done to ensure expectant parents in the Kamloops area will have access uh, to care once the region's largest maternity clinic closes this summer due to staffing shortages? So we've been working very closely with uh, the doctors and others working uh, in uh, maternity in Kamloops, and uh, we, we're very positive that there will be a solution to that worked out uh, in advance of uh, the closure you're talking about. Et je dirais en français juste très brièvement, parce que juste pour dire ce qu'on a, on a dit aujourd'hui, qu'à qu compter d'aujourd'hui des changements importants et, et uh, apportés aux restrictions qui étaient auparavant mises en place par les ordonnances de Dr. Henry et les directives ministérielles, en particulier les restrictions sur les visiteurs dans les établissements de soins de longue durée long-term care homes, les résidences services, assisted living, et les établissements de santé ont été levés. Cela comprend l'exigence d'une preuve de vaccination pour entrer dans les LTC, AL et HCVF, qui n'est plus en vigueur. Le test antigène rapide, RAT, test, dans les SLD n'est plus nécessaire. De plus, le port universel du masque par les, tous les personnels et les visiteurs n'est plus Okay, we'll go to the phones now. We'll hear first from Binder Sachin, CTV. Binder, please go ahead. 
Well, hi there. I'm just wondering, um, in the last couple of weeks, I feel like I've heard, and this is anecdotal, of course, uh, more people uh, contracting uh, COVID-19. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, I think hospitalizations may have shown that as well, but just wondering, like, you know, if you can talk a little bit about that and why you think now is the right time to be lifting these mandates. Yeah, so we look at this in many different ways, and some of which I presented today. So yeah, lots of people are still getting sick, um, and some people with COVID, but the, we're not seeing an increase in hospitalizations from COVID, and we're not seeing uh, increases in critical care and people getting very sick with COVID. And um, as we were showing, uh, the other respiratory illnesses that cause a lot of, uh, of sickness this time of year have come down dramatically. So prior to this pandemic, it is around this time of year that we would have the end of, of the respiratory season. And, and we're seeing that again this year, that it is at a place where it's manageable, it's not uh, causing, uh, overwhelming the healthcare system, but it's not gone away. And the, the data shows that, you know, COVID is definitely out there. But so are adenoviruses and enteroviruses and other things that cause uh, respiratory illnesses. And uh, so we always have to be aware of that. And if we are uh, sick ourselves with one of these, to stay away from others so we're not passing it on, to take all those measures that we know can make a difference. Follow up, Binder? No, I'm good, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we have time for one more question today. We go to Alexandra Sagan, The Logic. Alexandra, please go ahead. Hi, thanks so much. Um, my question is for the minister. I, I'm wondering, you know, today we got confirmation that both uh, Helen's Health and Harrison Healthcare are in discussions with the MSC and the ministry um, on the injunctions that were filed against them a couple months ago. And I'm wondering what has changed to have the government decide to engage on this outside the court system, and if you can shed any light on where that process is at today. Um, nothing's changed. The Medicare Protection Act applies in British Columbia. It will continue to apply. Uh, frequently, the Medical Services Commission intervenes when uh, uh, violations occur or, or there's concern about whether they've occurred and work that out with the provider to ensure that uh, patients are protected. In the case of uh, the two healthcare services you're talking about, a small portion of the TELUS uh, service in Harrison uh, Health, the uh, action was taken, injunctive action was taken, and those matters are before the courts. Medical Services Commission has taken action. It's normal in such a proceeding that there might be discussion, and those of you who are watching the proceedings know that there have been some adjournment. but. Uh, um, just to be clear, the Medicare Protection Act applies. Patients will be protected against extra billing in BC. We brought in measures in 2018, um, regulations that had not been in, in, brought into force to do that, and uh, that's what's occurring. But of course, um, uh, this is what the, uh, uh, the Medicare Services Commission, the Medical Services Commission under the outstanding direction of Dr. Halpany does uh, frequently. And so it shouldn't be a surprise, but it's not a change. What's, what it hasn't changed is our commitment to enforce the Medicare Protection Act and to protect uh, British Columbians against extra billing. Follow up, Alex? Yeah, just um, in a similar vein, the Supreme Court of Canada decision on candy surgery today um, dismissing the opportunity for an appeal. What, what happens to the clinic now? Uh, will it be shut down? Will it face fines going forward? Will there be retroactive fines? Just sort of what happens to that clinic now? Well, the law applies. Remember, you have to understand what the court case was. The court case was uh, can be surgical, and it received enormous, uh, breathtaking uh, fundraising from its supporters to bring the case over a very significant period of time. Uh, they brought a lawsuit against uh, the government. And it wasn't the other way around in that case. It's different than the injunctions we're talking about in the other matter. And so the decision by the Supreme Court ends the matter. And I, I just want to say it is an exceptional um, victory for public health care in BC, for the people of BC, for the Medicare Protection Act, for our public health care system. It supports public health care and has us do what we need to do, which is to provide continually better service under, public, under the public health care system. And that's exactly what we're going to do. I want to acknowledge the exceptional work by Jonathan Penner, all of the, all the lawyers who worked on this, in-house lawyers who worked on this at the Ministry of the Attorney General, who did, I think, 
on behalf of the people of BC an exceptional and brilliant job in defending public health care in the courts. But that issue was not a matter brought by the government of BC. It was a matter brought against the government of BC. Uh, obviously, at the trial stage, um, we had uh, the, our, our position was upheld. The government of BC effectively won at that stage, and now the Supreme Court is not going forward or not provided leave for appeal, so the matter is closed. And uh, unless, uh, uh, I think you can probably tell, I'm delighted. Thank you very much, everyone. That concludes today's event.